Mary Super Maramu uh, as it was built and many of the 54s. Uh, I believe he trained some of you uh, aboard URML when it was brand new and delivered in La Rochelle. Um, he's one of the first people that I met at AML uh, when I asked him um, for his suggestion on um, spares for cruising. And you know what, that list was absolutely perfect. It, uh, some of the things he, he listed, uh, I doubted, but I went ahead and bought and I was sure glad that I did. Uh, so today, Olivier is no longer uh, with Amel. He spent 19 years with Amel and he owns his own uh, survey company, Atlantic Yacht Survey, and uh, specializes in Amel's. Somebody has their mic open. Uh, check, uh, check your settings. Matt, I think you got your mic. No, open. I, I got it muted. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, this is Olivier right here in the middle of the screen, and he's doing what he does best, checking very closely everything on an ML. You know, the first survey that I had on our ML, the surveyor said, uh, did not climb the mast. He said there was not a line appropriate for climbing the mast. And I later found out that that's sort of a common excuse for not doing it. <laughs> Olivier has worked in boating all of his life. Uh, sailing school, worked at a sailboat rental agency. And of course, where most of us know him, he was the manager of Amel uh, after sales service for 19 years. Um, he started sailing when he was 13 years old. He served in the French Navy. Olivier has extensive knowledge of construction and equipment of an ocean class sailing yacht, especially a male. Olivier's experience allows him to uh, do pre-purchase surveys as well as insurance surveys. Uh, and in 2013, Olivier was certified as an expert evaluator. Um, I, I recommend Olivier for um, Amel surveys. And those of you that are my clients know that the only person that I recommend for a sur survey of an Amel is Olivier. Because when I recommend somebody as a surveyor, I must be 100% sure of that person's ability, knowledge, ethics, and honor. So Olivier is the only one that I recommend. And you can see the little cutout in the bottom right of your screen, that's right from my website. Um, there's nobody else listed there, only him. So it's my great pleasure to um, uh, introduce somebody that I just really, really like, uh, a very good friend, a very honorable and ethical person, Olivier, it's your meeting from here on. Um, okay, so should I uh, put my um, presentation? Yes. Yeah, yes. go ahead and put your yes. presentation up now. Okay. So, um, this one. Uh, so, so let's uh, and then and this. Okay, that's only the title. So be before I start, um, I would like to uh, thank Bill and Tilo for organ organizing this uh, Zoom meeting because I'm, I'm totally uh, um, unable to do this. So uh, I'm not very familiar with the Zoom meeting. Um, everything Bill said was uh, was true. I'm I'm 56 and I've been working 19 years at ML. I was not manager of the customer side 19 years. I've been on for five six years and I started at the at the bottom of the of the of the customer service. You know, working in boats, uh, launching the boats. In installing uh, the mast and, and preparing the boats for uh, their new owners. 
Um, so talking about surveys, um, uh, we're going to talk about pre-purchase surveys, not, not insurance uh, uh, claim surveys, which is something that I also do. And uh, so uh, I think this is uh, this may uh, be of interest for people who want to purchase an ML boat, but also for the people who want to sell their boat. Uh, because sometimes, you know, I, I see some boats that are uh, really not ready uh, for the survey. I mean, very, uh, or, or sometimes dirty or very dirty or um, uh, with many items not working. Uh, and it's 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 too bad because very image is going to be sold. So for, for the, the people who want to sell their boat, who are going to sell their boats in the future, I would say that they should uh, show a boat that is uh, in good condition, rather clean and. Um, this will ease, I think, the relation between the seller and the purchaser. Uh, so um, the way I, I, I conduct a survey is always the same way. And it, it always leads to the same uh, scheme. Um, it, it's basically the final part, uh, the hull, the deck, the mass and rigging, the inside of the boat and the engine room. And, and uh, this is also worse for other boats than the MN boats. I, I do also some surveys on other boats than the ML boats. So um, when checking the hull, um, I uh, Of course, the, the hull itself is very important. And so uh, um, I never make any moisture uh, test unless the boat has been out of the water for a long time. Uh, most of the time, 99% of the time, the boat is just uh, uh, just been taken out of the water. So of course, the, the, the hull is very humid and uh, <laughs> It, it, it would be really silly to perform moisture tests on the hull. Uh, so, uh, but of course, I, I have a look at the hull and look for bubbles. That's, that's the, the, the bad side of, of, of a hull. When you see bubbles, that's, that's probably meaning there, there, there are some problems. Unless you try to scrap them off, and sometimes, the bubble is only the anti -founding. And when you uh, remove the bubble, you see the hull in a good condition. So when you hold the boat out, uh, don't be scared if you see some bubble, you need to uh, know what these bubbles are. Okay, but if it's a hard bubble and uh, when you uh, burst it, you have some liquid, uh, that's time. Um, okay. Uh, what is the keel and the ballast? And um, so, of course, uh, when checking the keel and ballast, um, it's very important that the ballast is well attached to the keel stub. So um, there must not be any discontinuity between the keel stub and the ballast. And I also check some of the keel bolts inside the, in most AML boats that's inside the freshwater tank. And on the newer boats now, the bolts are um, of easier access because the, the water tank is no more in the keel stub. Um, 
So you can see here the inside of a, of a freshwater tank where you can see on, on, the, on the down edges some cracks uh, on both sides. And uh, the boat that has uh, been suffering uh, heavy grounding. And in fact, the ballast was a bit uh, uh, detached. So it was a, a rather bad survey. Huh? This ended up with uh, uh, no way because of this, of course. Olivier? Olivier, can I just ask you um, briefly, uh, you're, you seem to have a bandwidth is issue. So perhaps if you turn off your video camera, um, because we're, we're having your, uh, your, your audio okay. get j uh, jittery on us. So if you just uh, maybe okay. uh, turn off your video camera, write down. Yeah, great. Okay. You think it's okay now? Uh, but you, um, can you hear me now? Olivier, yes, much better. Yeah, we hear you. It's better, um, definitely oh, better, yeah. and we see your slideshow as well. Oh, okay. So that, yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm sorry if uh, my talking was not good up to now. It was coming in and out. So yeah, just keep going, and and uh, you're coming up much clearer now. I think there's no need for repeating, uh, but it's much clearer now. Okay. Anyway, uh, I think you understand the way I'm going to to do. And uh, if some people have haven't underst understood what I told them, then um, I think we will uh, treat this with the questions in the end. So uh, an important part of the hull is the rudder and skeg. Of course, uh, so um, checking this uh, is uh, always very important in order to know if the rudder is uh, moving uh, easily and also if it has not too much slack in its bearings and also with its uh, steering wheel cables. Uh, so that's, that's an important part. Also, an important part with the rudders in the ML boats is uh, the zinc anodes. And uh, so I always check the electric relation between the zinc anodes and the underwater parts of the boat, like mainly the, the propeller and the transmission and the ballast. That's, uh, that's an easy thing to do. And uh, yes, sometimes uh, it has to be improved or sometimes the ballast is no more connected. So um, of course, in my recommendation, I tell the, the purchaser to uh, connect it again. It's very important that the ballast is connected to the ground system. Um, I don't know why, but uh, Olivia, if you just anymore. if you just uh, just click anywhere on your slide, yes, then it gets your system back to the slide, oh, and now you can okay. press okay. ahead. Thank you, thank you, Tilo. Very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> Um, You're welcome. And another important part, as you know, is uh, the, the the transmission from the engine to the prop and the prop itself. And I always recommend that uh, we try to hold the boat out of the water as soon as possible before making the, the engine test. Because if the prop is not clean, then uh, it's, it's uh, pointless to make tests if, uh, with, a, with a dirty, prop, especially an auto prop, you will soon get vibrations and, and, and maybe um, you may think the, the engine is underpowered because you don't have the full power. So uh, 
before making engine test, uh, first thing is to have the boat out of the water or ask the owner uh, in, in a few days before the survey to have the prop cleaned by, by a diver. Um, because sometimes it's not possible to, to do the whole out uh, before the engine test. Um, so, of course, uh, on the transmission, very important is to check if it's moving or not uh, on its uh, bolt. You know, the, the, the bottom of the transmission is held to the ballast with one bolt. So it's important to check this. And also the condition of the propeller, uh, the blades, the ball bearings, or if it's a fixed propeller, if the blades are in good condition, and uh, also the corrosion of the prop, which can happen sometimes. Sometimes if you see a, a pink colored prop, this means it has suffered some, uh, at some point, uh, some corrosion. Um, and in, uh, for these uh, special AML transmissions, it's important to check any oil leak because you, if, if the shaft uh, bushing is not uh, properly uh, uh, tight, you will see some oil dripping or going out of the transmission. So, uh, and, and for the older boats, we have also uh, this, uh, more classical uh, kind of shaft, and uh, you can see in the picture a max prop. Uh, so that's also something to check. And as you know, the newer boats from AML have uh, um, come back to a classical uh, line shaft, or uh, I would say a, a drivetrain, which is uh, in line with the engine. Um, so in that case, very important to check the last bearing, the, the, what we call the cutlass bearing at the shaft output. It's very important that there, there is not too much slack because it, it gives vibrations and that's not good for the shaft itself. These long, shaft, these long shafts, as you know, they may suffer fatigue, fatigue stress. Uh, after long periods of running with vibra vibrations, and it ends up with a, with a breaking of the shaft. Huh? So that's not uh, very good. <laughs> um, all the, the ML boats since uh, 1985, they have bar thrusters. And uh, there has been different kinds of bar thrusters, but the most common on Super Maramus, Sun Twins, Maramus is the one you see there with a GRP prop and a very simple gearbox and a big uh, motor. So uh, I think all the maintenance uh, and what you have to care for is in the in the Amelie uh, Yacht Owners Group. And so uh, I will not say too much about this. Um, uh, what you, what any, anyone should check is that this bar thruster has not been too much modified. For instance, with steel screws instead of plastic screws for the propeller, or um, uh, yes, sometimes I see uh, uh, different kinds of uh, propeller or propellers that have been um, reshaped and that's uh, sometimes um, giving uh, vibrations you know? so it's better to replace with a, with a, with a regular prop uh, because uh, vibrations will uh, can damage the gearbox and the bearings and, and, and the seals especially the prop shaft seals um, that's a bar thruster for an ML 54. Uh, and 
there has been also uh, this kind of butter stuff with uh, five blade uh, propellers. And as you know, on the on the no, on the later models, like uh, this is a uh, Namel fifty five, that's uh, that's a stern thruster. <clears throat> also very important to check and check uh, for water tightness. Also very important. And. Um, the last thing on the hull is the through hull fittings, and that's also very important. A, a surveyor is is um, very uh, very uh, much worrying about two main things when surveying a boat: is uh, uh, is this boat uh, uh, able to uh, sink? Uh, so that means uh, can seawater easily come into the boat? And the second thing is. Can this boat easily uh, get fire? So uh, the fire side, uh, very worrying for a, for a surveyor. And this is more on the electrical side. Uh, most of the fires in a boat start with a, with a bad electric uh, system or a system that has been modified. Uh, in the wrong way. So through hull fittings, of course, it's very important to check if the through hull fittings are watertight, in good condition, the ones for the sensors, but also the ones for the for the valves, for the uh, bar thruster, and uh, any through hull fitting. There is one very big one uh, that's in the engine room for the uh, Transmission or even for the classical uh, drive shaft. So, uh, always very important to check for leaks, seawater leaks. Now that, that must be uh, a big uh, concern for surveyors. Okay. Um, and, and, and of course, a very important part of the hull check is how is the structure? Is the structure strong or are there signs of um, damages? Uh, on this picture, you can see that's on the starboard side of a Super Maramo. You can see one of those Omega um, reinforcement uh, pieces or uh, ribs, you could, you could uh, call them a rib. Uh, this one is completely delaminated from the hull. This is why you can see this uh, light color. The white color means it's totally delaminated. And you can see also that the rib is broken. So not only the rib is delaminated, but also broken in the middle. This uh, was due to the fact that the, the boat had been aground on the side and hitting rocks uh, with, the, with the hull on a starboard side. <laughs> so of course the surveyor must absolutely check uh, all, the, all the parts of the hull inside too, uh, because you may not see this from the outside, uh, but uh, inside when the boat has been aground and, and had a severe grounding, you may see some stringers broken, delaminated, or ribs like this, or inside the water tank. Uh, we can see here um, cracks in the jet boat showing that the, the GRP close that bond the, the that's a baffle, a baffle inside the water tank. So th these GRP uh, bonding clothes are here delaminated and you can tell because of these cracks. And here also, you can see the same kind of uh, cracks around the, um, the gel coat that covers the bonding clothes. So structure 
inspecting the structure is also important. Uh, okay, now we are coming to the deck. So the deck is also a very important part. I, I showed this picture because you can see on this picture that there has been some modifications on this boat. And of course, a part that than the, the classical checks you can do on a, on an ML boat, checking the, the hardware, the, the delamination of the, of the decks, or the, the windows, the hatches, all this. You have to pay attention if there, there has been a big modification. You can see a hard dodger uh, covering the cockpit with stanchions that are bolted to the aft deck. So of course, uh, this must be uh, monitored, especially where you have bolts going through the decks, because the decks are uh, uh, for 90% of the deck is made of a balsa sandwich. And if you drill holes in this sandwich, you must make sure no water is going to penetrate uh, the balsa wood, which would make it rot, and um, that would definitely damage the the sandwich. So pay attention to any modification of uh, of, of a deck. So of course, I know what are the modifications. You may not know what uh, has been modified because you are not, uh, uh, from most of you, you are not uh, so familiar with the, with the decks. Uh, that's uh, a picture, uh, an example of, um, of a deck. That's an Amel Supermaramu. Uh, I think that's year 93. And the deck have been completely uh, rebuilt, refit with a synthetic material. And this was, um, this one was really very well done. That's a very good example of a nice refit of a deck of a Superman. Um, uh, I showed this picture. I wanted to show you that's that's a bar thruster uh, of an ML54. And when you see, um, I don't know. If, you can see that the, in this compartment, which is originally white, uh, because it's painted with white gel coat, this is covered with black dust. And this dust is coming from the carbon brushes of the bar thruster. And if you see this, this means the, the, the bar thruster has been really overused for a long time. And then the, the, the carbon brushes have been uh, deteriorated. So this one will need uh, a, a full check of its motor, including replacement of the carbon brushes. So sometimes not cleaning an area can be also, uh, um, can tell also much about the condition of the, of the bar thruster. Uh, next part of the survey is checking the mast. So I will not tell you everything I check on the mast. You can you can tell probably I check if I see any crack in the in the mast in the aluminum extrusions. But the reason why it is very important that your surveyor uh, goes to the top of the mast. Uh, that's because. You can see this kind of thing. This is a shackle that holds the Genoa furler swivel. And you can see this shackle is about to uh, quit. And of course, if this happens at sea, um, you will see your Genoa uh, slowly come down. And then it will be uh, a big mess. <laughs> so the surveyor is also supposed to uh, Go up the mast, I think, and and check for this uh, for this uh, 
these troubles. This is not a big trouble, but this shackle needs to be replaced at once, for sure. Uh, another uh, part of the mast and rigging uh, part is all the furlers. So the furlers have to be uh, watched, of course, and, and tested. And you can see on this, that's the bottom of a Genoa furler on a, on a Super Marano. And it has a bracket, a stainless steel uh, plate bracket, which is totally bent. So this, this can be straightened, of course. But this means also that uh, this boat has been sailing without enough halyard tension on the Genoa. And the whole foil and furling unit has been uh, acting uh, as a sledgehammer, you know, every time the boat went in, into the waves, it it uh, it uh, bent this support. Uh, I don't know if you can see the. You will uh, ask me questions later. On. Okay, this is very frequent. I, I see this bent part on main boat. Another example why it's good to climb up the mast. You can see on this picture that the, 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 the angle of the spreaders is not the same. And this is uh, probably after the, the rigging has been replaced. And the people replacing the standing rigging have not set the spreaders at the same angle, which of course is not good. The, the spreaders must have the same angle. Very important. So again, very important that the surveyor goes up the mast. Uh, this is an example of a, of a Bama furler with a main. So that is a uh, Tilo, uh, my computer tells me the the internet connection is not steady. Yes, your audio is smearing. Yeah, again. could you just repeat the part about the Balmar furler because that uh, that completely cut out. Okay, the, so the picture is just showing rusty parts in the Balmar furler, and in fact, uh, I. I never open the, the, the furrows unless I test them first. And if I hear a very bad noise, then I suggest to the owner to open uh, the furrow because it's easy on a, on a Bama furrow. And that's, with, that's what we did that day. Other than that, I, I never open the furrows du during a survey. Huh? It's not my, my job to do it. But the noise of the furling systems must be also a warning. A, a, a strong and, and not soft noise must be a warning for something that has not been maintained or that is not working properly. Another thing that you cannot really see from the bottom of the boat, you can see that's at the top of the mizzen mast of the mizzen mast, the halyard has been installed out of the mast. So it has been replaced probably, but uh, in a wrong way. So you can imagine that this halyard will chafe a little bit uh, when, the, when there will be some pressure uh, on the sail. There, there is always some movement at the top of the sail. So this halyard will uh, easily uh, wear out. Uh, we are now inside of the vessel. <laughs> so uh, of course, very important to check the bulkheads and their color. And, and if the color has changed, uh, this may be the the sign of uh, rotten parts. So the, the, the bulkhead we see here is completely rotten. 
and will need to be replaced, which is sometimes really not easy, not an easy job, but um, it can be done, except the main bulkheads. The main bulkheads on the Amel boats are really a very, um, very big job, sometimes difficult to do. So that can, uh, that can really be a, a reason um, for not buying a boat, such a bulkhead. Uh, that's another example of what you can see inside the vessel. This is a, a hatch that has been installed uh, after the boat is built. Uh, someone wanted to have a, uh, one more hatch on the aft deck of a Super Maramu. And you can see the, the, the deck has been cut and you can see the balsa wood of the sandwich. Um, this means the people who have installed it uh, did not install it correctly. They should have removed the, the balsa wood for uh, two or three centimeters deep, replaced it with, uh, with uh, polyester or epoxy uh, filling compound, and then uh, installed the, the hatch on it. Huh? So this, is, this has to be redone. This will not be good. And the balsa wood will, will probably catch some uh, moisture after some years. Um, inside the vessel, you have also the, the batteries. Huh? We, we, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions about the batteries. Uh, but it, uh, what we see here is a, is a battery compartment with only, uh, uh, I think that's uh, eight batteries instead of 12. So if you have a, a boat with 12 batteries, you should have 12 batteries in the battery compartment, and not only uh, six or eight. Uh, we are again in, a, in, in the passageway of a Super Maramu, which has been uh, uh, transformed a lot. And in fact, what you see here um, is, a, is a workbench and all the drawers are filled, are filled with uh, So be careful when transforming the boat not to add too much weight to your boat. And sometimes I see boats that have too, far too much gear uh, in the boat and that's too much weight. And the boat is not designed for this. And especially, you know, the rigging of a boat is designed based upon the weight of the boat. If you load your boat too much, uh, it may stress the rigging too much too. So that was an example uh, uh, of an over-equipped boat. This is uh, a rudder shaft, the top of the rudder shaft in the aft cabin of the Super Maramu. Uh, you, it, this one is in rather good condition, except that the, the steering cables, uh, sheets and tubes uh, are unbalanced. And so uh, this is also not very good on that boat. In fact, uh, the, the wheel was totally unbalanced and we had to um, rebalance the, the tubes that hold the cables. So that's also something to check. Uh, this shouldn't be like this. Now we're going to start the engine room. Tilo, you tell me if I'm too long or you think it's no, okay? you're doing great. Okay. So we are in, in an engine room, Super Maramu again. And uh, what you can see here is um, the cradle of, uh, of the engine, which has been modified, deeply modified, in the way that you see the, the, the mounts under the cradle, but also you see a second 
mount between the cradle and the engine. Uh, so when I saw that, I was very surprised. And this is, uh, of course, uh, not possible. You cannot run an engine on two sets of uh, rubber mounts. Uh, the engine is too soft, and this will um, involve too much vibration and misalignment, and this will lead to the to the breaking of the drive shaft. And so, uh, be careful with this. If you see this kind of uh, heavy modification, uh, walk away. <laughs> I would say. Uh, this picture, I, I went once into a, an engine room and, and it was flooded, like you see on this picture. So, of course, I, my advice to the people selling the boat is uh, uh, just for surveyor comes, <laughs> have a look at the, at the room and uh, make sure it's not flooded. So of course the the which was out of order in this book, huh? which looks nice. However, okay, one more picture. That's that's uh, that. It's difficult to guess, but I tell you, this is uh, the hoses you see are seawater hoses, and someone has installed a, a plastic. Uh, uh, gardener type uh, fitting, uh, <laughs> probably, I, I know why, uh, probably to flush all the seawater circuits with fresh water, which is basically a good idea, but this shouldn't be made of such a quick fitting uh, um, garden uh, plumbing, but with a, a regular valve and a fitting, even if it's plastic, that can be a plastic valve but not uh, the kind of uh, pity that you have in your garden. Uh, this is also something strange that I saw on a, on a, on a Super Maramu. That's the fuel tank. That's the side of the stainless steel fuel tank. And the people have made uh, strangely uh, a hole uh, i don't know exactly why probably to inspect it but that's a very bad idea to do it on the side if you uh, if you have a, a fuel tank without inspection hatches and if you want to make some then you have to do it on the top of the tank not on the side okay because this may uh, lead to leaks and to uh, big problems. Uh, so that's that's an example of a, a, a rusty area. You know, that's an ML55. So um, also, it's better to keep the rust out if possible before showing your boat uh, that you want to sell. Okay, I think that's the last picture. Um, okay, Tilo, okay. I think we, maybe we can start the questions. Okay, great. Oh, so if you, yeah, you can just stop sharing your screen and maybe then we see if, if when you're not sharing the screen, maybe you turn your camera back on. Yeah. and see how that goes. So I had a couple of questions. Um, um, uh, one was uh, specific. You were showing cracks in the water tanks and uh, on the and, the and the delaminated ribs. Uh, and Robert was uh, was asking how how does one you know what what is the repair for that? Oh, uh, that's that's uh, uh, in my opinion. Uh, uh, that's something that the the seller has to do. I I, I would say, uh, don't buy a boat that shows uh, so many uh, bad things. 
Now, if the seller and the buyer are okay, uh, I have nothing against, but then the, the purchaser uh, has to know, and I tell him, of course, what he will have to face. In that case, um, when, when I see cracks in the, in the freshwater tank, that means uh, uh, the access to the whole freshwater tank is going to be needed. That means a lot of uh, taking down of the furniture. And sometimes the inspection hatches of the freshwater tank has to be enlarged. You know, made bigger for better access and then rebuilt to be uh, as original. So you can imagine these are uh, big works. Uh, however, if it's only a question of tightening the, the keel bolts, this can be done with the hatches, with the openings as they are. You don't need to to uh, enlarge the openings. But if you need to uh, reinstall bonding close with GRB, uh, then sometimes you need to make these holes bigger and that's a big work. Okay, uh, great. Um, now I've Got a couple of questions on the sort of logistics of of this. Um, so, uh, so Harry was asking, what is the approximate cost of a survey on a fifty four? And then my my addition to that would be, and does the do different models of AMELs have have different cost considerations just for the survey itself? Uh Yes, uh, I speak for myself, of course. I, I don't know what my uh, colleagues do. But yes, I spend more time uh, when the boat is bigger and has more equipment. So uh, for a 54, currently a 54, that's 1,400 euros plus VAT. Mm -hmm. Unless I, I sell this survey to a company and then for uh, companies out of the EU, no VAT, and for companies inside the EU, uh, the, and, and this company has a, has a VAT number, then there is no VAT. Okay. And the VAT is 20%. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for that's for a fifty-four. Is there any any significant difference for a, a Super Maramu or a Santorin? Uh, uh, for instance, uh, Santorin will be twelve hundred without VAT, and and uh, and a uh, fifty-five or or, or sixty-four. Sixty-four will be uh, much much more because the sixty-four is very complicated. And uh, I really spend a lot of time in this. Okay. And that's, uh, that follows on to a question that Brian asked is how much time should be allowed for the survey? Um, one person had mentioned that you had surveyed uh, his boat in, in one day. Yes. Uh, and so, yeah, is it, uh, is it a one day job? Is it more than that? It's between what, you know, the day can be uh, short or long depending on the season. Uh, so uh, uh, that's one full day in summertime. I may need some more time in the winter time because it's dark and I, I don't like to work in the dark. And uh, yes, sometimes also depending on the haul out facilities and uh, how quick the boat gets back in the water that can delay. And so when I'm traveling, I always schedule two days, and uh, so that I have some uh, some uh, uh, time to lose. Uh, mm -hmm. if it happens. And uh, is there a difference uh, between a, a a survey for 
for valuation purposes versus a purchase survey? Um, no, I, I don't make any difference. And uh, the, the insurance companies, they would like the surveyors to just fill up um, uh, an Excel sheet, you know, but mm -hmm. I don't like that. So I, I, I do exactly the same for a valuation survey, pre-purchase survey or insurance survey. It's always the same kind of inspection. It, it lasts the same time and uh, it's the same report. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as far as the survey is concerned, uh, uh, one person was asking, does, does this, the boat need to be out of the water for a significant amount of time prior to the survey to, in order to fully and properly inspect it? Out of the water, I need between one and two hours. Mm -hmm. But uh, should... considering considering the the hull is keen because when we haul out the boat, if, if it's very uh, dirty, uh, then uh, I ask for the hull to be clean. But I ask this question in advance to mm -hmm. the owner. I always ask how long, uh, when was the last haul out for uh, anti -carving? If he tells me two years then I ask definitely that he schedules a, a hull cleaning before I can work because otherwise uh, that's mm -hmm. really pointless. Okay, um, and one, uh, one question that uh, actually Eric has several questions, but one of those is uh, how many AMLs have you found with osmosis? And if you want to check for osmosis, how long should the boat be out of the water prior to your inspection? You know, I, I'm talking about osmosis when it is visible. And then I, I uh, assess how bad it is. Sometimes I see small bubbles only on the rudder. And then uh, for me, it's, it's not a big deal, although the rudder will need to be treated, but uh, it's not a reason uh, for the purchaser not to buy the boat. Uh, if I see um, two centimeters bubbles on the hull and uh, about 30 uh, bubbles per square meter, then I suggest that uh, the purchaser does not buy the boat. For me, it's up to the owner, the current owner to do the job and sell his boat once the job is done. Because the job can take six months. That's the problem. And not all the people are ready to buy a boat that needs six months of hard work. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, Olivier, uh, <clears throat> just to come back to that question of mine, uh, how many uh, Super Maramus or Amels did you find with osmosis in your career? Very few, very few. The reason is, is that, I don't know if you know, but I tell you, since 1987, uh, and, and uh, that's about the years when the osmosis uh, problem um, uh, started uh, in, in the GRP construction, um, Amel, uh, since 19, 1987, Amel lays a, um, a coat uh, of resin with glass scales, which are small uh, particles of glass, about two millimeters in diameter. Uh, and this is to prevent uh, from water penetration. So this coat is applied right after the gel coat in the mold. And so Amel sprays the gel coat first, and then applies the resin with the glass scales and then starts with the glass scales. And, and they still do it on the new boat. Mm -hmm. So very, very uh, I see really very uh, few Amel boats with osmosis, but I've seen, I've seen Super Maranus, I've seen a, 
on mango, especially with lots of bubbles. Uh, and then the people buy or don't buy, but they know that there is a, a problem that they will have to face, maybe not now, but in the future. Oh, yeah, that's reassuring uh, that most of the supermarmos don't have it. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So you, you can ask me then why? If they are protected with these glass scales, why is there uh, osmosis? Um, uh, one of the problems that can happen to a hull is uh, people cleaning the hull with two powerful pressure machines. Uh, in e every harbor in the world, even in La Rochelle, you can rent a machine that uh, pushes 200 bar uh, water pressure. And if you don't pay attention, if you come too close to the hull, or, um, you know, there's a barnacle, and to, if you want to remove the barnacle, you use the high pressure machine instead of a scrapper, then you will damage the, the GRP. You will not see at once, of course, that, that the damage is done, but uh, in two or three years, you may see some bubbles. Uh, so the um, very important is not to use a machine with more than 80 bar pressure and, and not too close to the GRP, uh, not, not less than 20 centimeters. If there is uh, really a lot of dirt, you'd better remove it with a, with a tool, you know, with a, with a scrapper, yes. Okay, yeah. Be careful with your GRP. <clears throat> mm -hmm. That's always a good thing. One question. Also, I, I have, I have uh, remarked that when I saw the osmosis, it was uh, more on the vertical parts of the boat, like the keel stub, the skeg, and the rudder. And my, um, my idea is it is easier to damage these areas more than the hull, because when you hold your uh, high pressure gun to the hull, it's more tiring, so you don't you don't stay a long time. If it's to the kill stub or the skeg, it's easier to hold it uh, a long time, and uh, you know uh, this is maybe the reason why these uh, areas are more damaged than the hull usually. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, another question we have is how often do you see uh, or have you ever seen uh, loose keel boats in uh, an Amel? Um, not very often, not very often. I, I, I'm sure uh, because uh, when people have a severe grounding, they, uh, they repair it. Uh, most of the people repair it. And sometimes there is one that does not pay attention and who does not repair it. But I think really that most of the people, they put a, a claim to their insurance and they ask for the repair of, uh, of the boat. Mm -hmm. That's why I, I, I think I don't see so many. Good, okay. Uh, so I've got a couple of questions basically about the uh, the engine the mechanical diagnostics of engine generator uh, is is your inspection do you do a, a, a visual or do you do you suggest that people also get a, a, a mechanic to do a specific engine generator uh, test uh, again that's that's a frequent question from my clients they they always ask me uh, do you do a, an oil uh, analysis? <laughs> so I've got in my tools everything to get oil samples, but I do this only in case I have a, a big doubt about the, the engine. But the most important is to uh, first test the engine. Uh, 
Uh, so make a test, let the engine warm up, uh, test it at sea at full power, check the vibrations, the heating, the uh, noise, the leaks, the smokes, and uh, everything that could uh, that could uh, tell that the engine is not 100%. A very, very frequent uh, thing that happens is uh, about the turbo of, uh, of the engines which are fitted with turbos. When the turbo is seized, you can, um, of course, you don't have the, the full power of the engine. So this is definitely something to check by, uh, by, by the local uh, Yanmar or uh, Volvo dealer. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, but making an oil analyze, analysis is something uh, uh, that should be done in a special way. That means the oil should, should be replaced. The new oil should be run for five, 10 hours, and then the sample should be taken. If you make an oil analysis on, a, on a, maybe a, a three, four years old oil uh, with, uh, with uh, 500 hours, which uh, sometimes happen, uh, you will not be able to tell much. So, um, uh, but, but probably some other things will tell me that there is a problem, uh, especially the smoke at the exhaust and or the vibrations or overheating uh, of the engine. Okay. Okay. Um, now a question, uh, I noticed, we noticed that you mentioned that, uh, you know, if a boat has a, a battery compartment for 12 batteries, mm -hmm. you should have 12 batteries. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, a lot of people are switching over to lithium, which of course, uh, they don't need the, the capacity uh, that 12 lithiums would give them. Uh, so is there, a, why, what is the reasoning for saying you should, you should fill that compartment? Well, um, the, if the boat has been designed with a, tw uh, a compartment for 12 batteries, uh, you should keep it as it is. Uh, first thing is to avoid uh, having questions from your buyer. Um, and uh, I think, uh, for instance, if you have 12 batteries and one or two batteries are uh, in short circuit, of course, you can just disconnect one or two pairs and your, your boat will be okay with eight batteries, no problem, even six batteries. Less than this, then uh, this may be a problem in the voltage drop when using big motors and the bar thruster. So uh, really uh, be careful with this. And uh, when I check the batteries, I, I uh, put a load on them uh, for two, three hours. And I, I check uh, how quick the voltage drops. That's, that's the first thing. And uh, after charging the, the batteries, I check them separately just to check if one is in short circuit. Because a battery uh, which has an element in short circuit uh, is very dangerous. This, this can really... Uh, uh, make the, the battery compartment explode. And it, it, it has already happened. And uh, yes, so it's very important, even for, for the people who don't want to sell their boat, once a year, disconnect all the batteries and test them. If you find one battery with 10 volts instead of 12, or, or 10.5 instead of 12.8, uh, you really need to uh, disconnect this pair of batteries. Okay, good. Um, now, uh, one person was asking about the, the AML practice of having... Uh, oh, having... Oh, sorry, sorry, Tilo. Yeah. Um, I think about the lithium batteries, uh, because you mentioned the lithium batteries. Mm -hmm. I have not much experience about the lithium batteries, but... Um, they, they, are all, they can be also dangerous. Uh, 
like the lead acid batteries can explode. Uh, in fact, the, batteries, the battery does not explode. The gas uh, uh, going out of the battery can uh, lead to an explosion. And uh, the lithium batteries uh, are also, uh, uh, in my opinion, a bit dangerous. And, and you know, some, some batteries in Samsung phones uh, 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 did catch fire. And in, in the aircrafts, you cannot take big lithium batteries uh, in, the, in, the, in the baggage lock, locker. Okay, so um, installing lithium batteries on a boat is a bit different like uh, installing lithium batteries on a car. On a car, if something uh, catches fire, you just leave the car and, and it burns. In a boat, you have to deal with the fire and that's, that can be a problem. So when installing lithium batteries, you must absolutely vent the battery compartment with a, with a fan with in and out uh, openings. It must be sealed and there must be an automatic fire fighting system included in this compartment. Okay. That's, that's the least. Okay. Hello, may I come in at this point? Uh, okay, Alexander. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I have purchased my ML54. That was the first of the last year's production of the Gold Line in uh, 2013, and I have had a really major technical problem in vibrations uh, inside. And uh, Olivier Bonsoir, um, uh, helped Bonsoir. me a, lo a, a lot with that. Uh, I had a survey of three days, and and um, uh, it was really helpful and I've been three years in, in La Rochelle uh, in training in in technical development uh, of, of the ML I've been really I'm, I'm really fascinated about that and I had a, a lot of uh, help of uh, Olivier about that and uh, and I've further developed the boat uh, with a lot of uh, also electronical uh, equipment and uh, with renewable energies out of solar of, of, of windshield and and of, uh, of a hydrogen generator. <clears throat> and uh, I'm on the North Atlantic since a couple of years. I'm doing my one hands, single handed sailing also is there and I have extensive, extensive uh, experience with that. Yeah? And I just can uh, double underline what, uh, what Olivier said that a, a, a solid capacity of the 24 volt battery bank is really, um, is, is really the key point yeah, for keeping the energy production from solar, from wind, from, from hydro generator with the consumption that you have. Yeah, and you learn if you, uh, if you really dig into the, uh, the, uh, the, the topic when to take out the energy of, of your battery bank and when to put it in. Yeah? And I'm very happy with that. And also the teaching that Olivier has gave, given me with a 12.6, 12.3 or whatever voltage uh, uh, I, I got to have in there before I see that the batteries uh, run weak. Yeah? And additionally, uh, I did not, uh, I know that there's an extensive discussion on the ML Yacht Owners Forum net about lithium batteries. I have uh, two pairs of batteries for my Toki2 outboarder and I'm very happy with that. And I, I'm, um, but I, I, uh, I did check uh, exactly also the risk of lithium batteries yeah, uh, on board and I'm very happy to have them in the aft locker. I would not be so very uh, happy to have them in, in, inside the ship. Yeah? So um, just to say it with one word, uh, I would, uh, I'm very happy with my standard batteries uh, with, with 12 of them. And, I, uh, and, and for the energy um, uh, management on board, even to have uh, to a very maximum level of autonomy that I, that I have developed there, this is really the key factor. Mm hmm. OK, um, good. So that's uh, that's interesting to hear. Um, so uh, what we had also one person was asking about the AML standard of of having gray water drain into the bilge. 
Um, and asking about on an older boat, like a, a Sharky or, or, or Maramu, would, how do you feel about seeing when people put that into a dedicated through hull instead of having it drain, drain into the bilge? I'm not sure I have uh, understood the question. You mean um, some, some uh, 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 galley sinks or wash basins are draining directly? Through yes. And, and in some I mean, of have you have you seen people uh, plumb the uh, the gray water, the galley sinks, and the showers to through hulls instead of in, into the bilge? Um, yes, I, I've seen that for galley sinks only. Because for showers, it's not really possible. They are too low, and uh, wash basins could be possible, but but. Um, I have really nothing against draining the galley sink directly overboard because, you know, through the galley sink, you may have a lot of uh, food debris and this may clog the grey water uh, um, bilge in the engine room and this may be a problem. So, uh, yes. It, 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 making a straight drain from the galley sink outboard is not a problem. Of course, you need to install a valve on it, but, uh, but uh, why not, why not? But this is going a little okay. bit out of uh, Henry Amel philosophy. But, 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 he, this was standard on, on the Maramu. Mm -hmm. On the Maramu in, in the years, um, 80 to 90, roughly, the maramu and the mango was draining the galley sink directly outboard. Okay. Um, I've got a couple of questions about um, standing rigging. Uh, specifically, is how long do you feel that that uh, standing rigging should, uh, should be or when should it be replaced? What interval do you recommend for replacing it? And is it uh, is there a difference between med uh, med versus tropics? Um, uh, the question comes, of course, always, <laughs> and my answer is always the same. Uh, I don't answer with years, but with miles. And you know, these boats, and I know some boats that have been around the world within two years. So if you've been around the world and back uh, to La Rochelle, <laughs> then it's time to change your rigging. Or, although if it's only two years, okay? That's because of the miles. That's, that's so roughly that's 40 to 50,000 miles. Uh, at least at 40 to 50,000 miles, you must have a deep inspection of the standing rigging that you can see. And the one you cannot see, such as the forestay, because it's uh, under the, the furling foil, then you need to inspect it or just replace it. The forestay is always the first to be replaced because it works a lot. It works, it works bent a little bit, curved at least, and it, it, you have the furling foil uh, working on it. So that's really the, the most um, uh, loaded uh, cable on these boats, on the AML boats. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, keep in mind 40 to, to 50,000 miles, and in terms of years, uh, I start seeing broken strands on the on the original cables. Of course, depending on the navigation, but uh, I know some boats that have never left La Rochelle, almost <laughs> that have been sailing just on the Atlantic coast of France, and definitely after twenty five years, it's time to replace the rigging. But of course, it can happen before 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, then there, but some, of course, some insurance companies say every 10 to 12 years, no matter what. Mm -hmm. uh, you then know, you have no choice. Mm -hmm. Of course. So it's very important. That's what I tell my clients too. Ask your insurer and ask, ask them to write it down. What is the policy? What will they do if uh, a, a cable of the standing rigging breaks and it leads to a dismasting? Uh, and they, they must answer you, well, after 10 years, you get nothing. Or, or, or they will tell you, well, uh, after 10 years or 15 years, you will get so much percent of, uh, of the damage. But they, they should be able to answer you. More and more, they tend to uh, tell you that after 10 years and, and, uh, and uh, this must thing, you get nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay. But this must be discussed before you purchase the insurance contract. Sure. Definitely. Okay, a, a couple of people have asked about uh, copper coat anti-fouling and uh, what experience you've seen with uh, copper coat treatments on AMELs. I haven't seen so many. I've seen uh, copper coats on maybe uh, five to 10 boats. So not so many really. I must say uh, the, the it looks very good. Uh, for sure, when applied, you must be very careful. The, the, the shipyard that does the, the job must be very careful to apply it and also not to put this copper coat on metal parts. There are not so many, but for instance, no copper coat on the stainless steel rudder supports on the, of course, on the drive shaft, on, on the metal parts generally. And, and when you put on the ballast, of course, you must make sure the epoxy fairing compound is totally sealed. You know, there, there is no copper coat directly on the, on the metal. They should know, they know about that. The, I mean, the shipyards that uh, apply copper coat, they know that they, they should not put this copper coat on metal parts. And also, uh, I've seen on most of these boats that the shipyard had put a sheet of plastic or, or rubber between the zinc anode and the rudder blade, which is correct. Uh, you must not put the zinc directly on the copper coat. Otherwise, it wears out very quickly. But I've seen one without a sheet. Huh? So, of course, the, there, was not, uh, there was no more, uh, not much more zinc uh, left. And I told uh, the owner because of this. Huh? So, but it's, it's a small thing. I think it works fine. Uh, all the people uh, uh, I have asked told me it was okay. And I've read on the AML forum that uh, um, some people were um, very pleased with this. I'm thinking about uh, Jan Jenkins, uh, who is uh, definitely uh, someone to trust. <laughs> so, uh, uh, well, I, I think it's, it's, a good, uh, it's a good thing. But okay. Well done. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Um, one person was saying that they've been quoted uh, when when uh, talking with potential surveyors. They've been uh, told also that they might need to get um, uh, thermal image imaging or ultrasonic. Do you find uh, that these kinds of tests have any any benefit in AMELs? Ultrasonic for uh, GRP hulls. Yeah. Um, why not? But I, I, I don't see. Uh, I don't see really what, unless you you think uh, uh, 
there is a lot of uh, air bubbles in the GRP, but that's not the case in AML boats. <laughs> and um, yes, well, that could happen in case of a big repair. Of course, if the repair has not been well done, but then you should know about the repair. You can see the repair because most of the time on a big repair, you see a difference in color of the top sides. You see also from the inside that some stringers and bonding uh, clothes have been replaced. At least I see this because I know the kind of special glass clothes that Amel uses. It, you can recognize it. And if someone applies other clothes, it is never the, the, the Amel clothes. So, uh, and then it's easy to tell uh, if, if there has been a repair. And then if I have a, a doubt about the repair, I do some tapping, but I have never used ultrasonic uh, uh, measurements. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So it's, um, and then one person asked about during the survey, is it, uh, is it possible to, to really control for the quality of the membranes in the water maker? Um, I run the water maker. If, if the owner wants me to do, because some, some of them tell me, oh, no, no, no. It's winterized, uh, I don't want, okay, so then I don't do it. <laughs> but when I do, I run the water maker, mainly to check for seawater leaks. Remember, the surveyor worries about the boat sinking, okay? So running the water maker uh, to make sure there is no seawater leaks. And also the, the problem with, uh, with seawater leaks on the water maker is if it happens on the high pressure side, you make a drizzle of uh, seawater in the engine room and then it's, it's a nightmare for all, all, the, all the equipment. So, okay, mm -hmm. so I run this to check, to check the seawater leaks and then I check how much water is produced and I taste the water. I don't measure the the PPM because it, it can vary a lot. Huh? So uh, yeah. um, if I don't find the water uh, salty, I, I say it's okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, so we'll go we somebody, my, my experience is you should always just assume you have to replace the membranes. <laughs> yes. and, you know, if I run the water maker, if it's a 100 liter per hour, that makes 100 uh, liters per hour uh, with no leaks, for me, it's okay. I, I, mm -hmm. I, and there's no salt uh, uh, test, taste, sorry, then for me, it's okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, now, what uh, Pat and Scott were asking, is there, you know, when do you get an instant feel from a, a boat? You know, if you get on get onto a, a Marmu, Super Marmu, and, and look around the boat, can can you fairly quickly sum up the the sort of the the overall condition of the boat in a general sure. sense? Sure. sure. Uh, if you if you look inside the boat and. Uh, uh, it's, it's a bit dirty. I mean, it's dirty in, in some hidden places or the engine room is very black and oily. Uh, black and oily, that means there has been lots of oil spill or the people changing the oil are not careful or black because of the uh, rubber dust from the belts. Uh, this is not good. And, and then I can tell you, but after that, I check all the equipments and I find one, two, three, five pumps out of order and, 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 and so on. So uh, um, for sure, someone who wants to sell his boat should at least make a good cleaning and make sure 
but all the equipments are uh, working. Okay, but if we start, you know, sometimes my surveys, uh, the first document I, I give to my clients after the, the survey is just a list of all my findings. And the list can be uh, half a page to two pages. If it's a two page boat, uh, you can guess uh, that uh, <laughs> there will be some discussion. Okay. And then the report comes after four or five days because I need some time to write the report. But uh, only the list can tell the, the buyer uh, that uh, he's going to face or not problems. But okay. within, yes, within two or three hours, I can make a first statement uh, of what I'm going to find. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. I've got a couple of questions, basically uh, talking about um, sort of build quality over time and sort of longevity and reliability. Uh, so, you know, what have you seen in differences as far as workmanship build quality per, between, for instance, the, the Maramu and the Santorin? Uh, and are boats like the Euros and the Sharky, do you feel that they're, they're um, capable or, or one should expect them to have a life uh, span of 50 years or greater? You know, uh, talking about the Euros and this generation, it was the start of the GRP construction. And uh, these boats were uh, really over dimension, definitely. So these boats were very strong, for sure. S strong, I mean, uh, in uh, a grounding situation. Uh, and then um, to make these boats a bit faster, uh, Amel and other builders, they reduced uh, the thickness of the, of the hull. And also they, they put less bulkheads and, and stringers. And, and I think now uh, it has come to uh, more balanced boats, I think. A good, a good compromise between weight and speed and reliability. So the, the, best, the best compromise is uh, Super Maramu 54, and, and the next ones. Before, uh, yes, the boats were a bit too heavy. That means, of course, very strong, but sometimes a bit slow. That's the downside of these boats. Mm -hmm. but, but I'm sure a Santorin or Super Maramu has, a, has an 80 years uh, life. Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as long so... As it is maintained, and, 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 and mm -hmm. if damaged, Repaired, of course. Huh? Certainly, certainly. Um, so, in in general terms, with Amel's, uh, is is there one problem that you see is is prevalent that you you see consistently across surveys that have to be uh, most or more often repaired or addressed? Um. It's difficult to answer. It's, it's very difficult to answer. No, no. The structure um, and, and the mast, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I've never seen uh, uh, something uh, just, just falling off like this. All the other parts, they can be replaced, like the standing rigging or the engine, the generator, the plumbing, the the, the valves, the bar thruster, these are all only equipments, but the structure, as long as it's not caught in a, in a, in a storm and in a harbor, because a storm at sea, that's okay, but a storm in a harbor, that's the problem. Huh? Boats hitting themselves, each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so as long as there's no such, uh, such conditions, uh, Oh, that's, that's only a question of replacing 
the, the, the damaged equipment, pumps and, and electronics and, and lights and, and sometimes to improve the systems, huh? improve the power consumption. The LED lights have improved a lot the, the, the power question, for sure. Okay. Um, so, okay, I've got two more questions uh, here. One is, um, what do you look at in, um, in repowering? How do you feel about uh, the, the options that you've seen people undertake in repowering vessels? Um, especially, you know, looking at Maramus or Santorins, we're seeing a lot that have, uh, that have repowering after their ancient engines go out. Uh, what do you feel is the appropriate horsepower to put in one? Uh, horsepower, um, uh, the same, the same as the as the architect uh, put in the beginning. Uh, first of all, uh, when you build uh, a leisure craft within the European uh, directive, you cannot. Uh, increase the power of, of, uh, of a boat more than 10% without re, uh, um, uh, inspecting and, and redesigning the boat. And so if you have a Santorin which has been built with a 50 horsepower engine, uh, keep the 50 horsepower you can put 60 horsepower first of all it will not change a lot to the hull speed and uh, uh, yes sometimes you have no choice huh? there, there is no more 50 horsepower there is a 40 horsepower and then the 60 horsepower you can put the 60 horsepower but, uh, i mean uh, the the speed of the boat is is uh, determined by the hull so uh, you can put 100 horsepower on the Santorin. It, it, the maximum speed with the engine will not be increased. And mm -hmm. uh, at cruising speed, uh, for instance, on a Supermaru, which is equipped uh, as a standard with an 80 horsepower, and some engines have 100 horsepower, at cruising speed, you use about uh, 30 to 40 horsepower. And the, the more power you need is when maneuvering in harbors. This is when you need the 70, 80 horsepower, or a bit more. And then, of course, you need some power for the alternators. But I mean, don't put a 120 horsepower in a Supermarmo. It will not change much. It will not, uh, uh, change the speed of the boat, it will not help you more in the docking maneuvers. Uh, so, uh, and don't, don't go too far uh, compared with the original engine. Thilo, this is Alexander again. May I come in to this point with a very personal uh, deep experience? Okay, just briefly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, very shortly. Um, I do sailing since 14 years. I did diving before. Yeah? And uh, I love to be outside in the rough nature. And I just had one really difficult and dangerous um, experience in all my times. And this when, the, when I had uh, a willy war uh, in north of Lanzarote. And in the night, I had an increasing storm going from 8 before to 11 before in the morning. And I, I did stand up in the cockpit. And in the morning, I did lift up the anchor and went against 11 before and two meter seas. And I have found out, I never had that before and again, hopefully. Yeah, but uh, just going with the engine of 110 horsepower to 2,500 RPM, and this is by far not the maximum that this engine does, did bring by far enough force for going uh, against 11 before 
and two meters waves. Yeah. So this is not only in the in 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 port maneuvers where you usually usually need your engine. If you're in really life danger, uh, then I would I'm very very happy that I have such a strong engine uh, in a in a 54 um, uh, 54 boat. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so just to wrap this up here, uh, well, so I see Rudy, you had your hand up here. Is there, do you have a brief question here? So, sorry, Tilo, this was my mistake. Okay. <laughs> okay. Never mind. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just to wrap this up, there's a, there's a, a general philosophical question here. And, uh, and of course, it, it, it derives from Bill's uh, adage about, uh, you know, about a, a, a getting a cheap, uh, cheap boat is maybe not always the best deal. Uh, and from, from your perspective, is it, uh, you know, is there a, a you know, a, a balance between, you know, price and reliability? Uh, as far as the, the deal that you're getting on the boat? Um, um, that's not the only question, I would say. When buying a boat, uh, a, a cheap boat, and you know you're going to have a lot of work to, to do, you must, you must be okay with this. You must uh, accept that you need um, six months or 12 months uh, of work in the boat, and maybe you like it. Uh, so, some people really buy cheap boats, not only because they are cheap, but because they want uh, um, a safe structure in which they will install this water maker, these batteries, this and this and this. So uh, that can be an option for some people and they will like it but you must be ready uh, for taking time to do it. Some people want to buy an AML boat and leave for a long trip after two or three months, just for the time they, they, they need to, uh, uh, to uh, learn the boat. So, um, and, and of course, uh, buying a boat that is really ready for long cruising is more expensive. So uh, uh, I have all kinds of sellers, all kinds of uh, boats for sale, and all kinds of clients. Rec very recently, a young man, maybe he could be my son, I guess, uh, bought a uh, Super Marabou, uh, in which there is a lot of work to do, but he's okay with this. And I told him, that, that's the best way to learn a boat. You will go uh, through the boat and uh, slowly work in the boat, replacing this and that. And that's the best way to know your boat for your project in, in two or three years of uh, one world cruising. Uh, Maybe did I cover uh, this question or? Yeah, I think that that gives a, a good uh, a good explanation. I think Bill, you. Uh... Yeah, I want to I want to wrap it up. Uh, we could go on for uh, two more hours. Uh, we're well over. We're forty minutes over. And uh, Olivier, I really appreciate uh, you doing this for us today. And I'm sure that everybody in this uh, Zoom meeting and all of the people that are gonna view it afterwards will really appreciate it too. Um, but we have to respect everybody's time and 40 minutes over <laughs> a one hour meeting at one hour and 40 minutes is time to, <laughs> it's time to bring it to an end. So again, Olivier, thank you so very much for doing this. Um, your presentation was very informative. Your answers to the questions were unbelievably on point. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm gonna add one thing, only one thing to, uh, to something that we just discussed at the last, and that is to say what I always say, and that is sometimes the cheapest amount 
will be the most expensive amount when you get it in condition. <laughs> it, 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 uh, it just happens that way. So again, thank everybody and you too, Olivier. Okay, so may I suggest something? Maybe yes, uh, one more thing. <laughs> we, could, uh, we could just uh, uh, do one, uh, one meeting like this in six months. And in, yes. between, in between, maybe just focus, uh, uh, I mean, collect questions that focus on some points that have not been covered uh, this time. Olivier, if you would do that for us, we would all love it, right? Does everybody agree yeah. with me on that? Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe before someone has to collect some questions and, and we can do a meeting uh, like this. Because the value of the uh, mm -hmm. us to do this, huh? It's, it's uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, one really quick question, uh, because uh, a couple of people have asked, what is your availability? How long in advance do they need to book a survey with you? Usually it's, it's three to four weeks, depending on the location, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. If I okay. go uh, far away, it's, it's a bit more time to uh, organize the trip and all this. But usually that's three to four weeks. And can you okay. travel now, course, Olivier? Of course, if it's if it's about in La Rochelle or in France, it's quicker. Um, but uh, it, it can be quicker, especially in La Rochelle, where there are lots of uh, Amel boats. And then three to four weeks, we're there. Yeah. Um, and so, and have you been able? I guess it's been pretty difficult to travel uh, internationally lately, hasn't it? Sure, sure. I had to cancel uh, in the springtime. I had to cancel a trip to Antigua. Uh, and in fact, in the springtime, I was very uh, worried about my business <laughs> because I, I really did not work for two months and a half. And, and then it, it came back uh, really quickly and massively. So uh, I don't worry. Uh, I'm traveling easily throughout Europe. So I've been to Germany, uh, Netherlands, Spain, Italy, Sicily, uh, really easily. But with tests, I have to make a, a, a test for virus before taking the flight. And now I can see there are less and less flights in Europe. Mm -hmm. OK, great. But I, I'm still traveling. Yes. Terrific. Are we done? Are we done? Yep. I think. Okay. Uh, then it, yeah. You, you might want to say next meeting is uh, yeah. next month is Jimmy Cornell, right? And Jimmy Cornell is going to uh, present preparing for a Pacific crossing. Hmm. Very interesting. <laughs> Thank you, okay. everybody. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Olivier. And uh, thank you, Bill, for setting this up. It's been a greatly informative session. I really, uh, I've had a great time and, uh, and I wish everybody well. Look forward to seeing you next month. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Wishing thank you. Week. Ciao. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Ciao, <laughs> ciao. Thanks a lot. Thanks uh, a lot. Thank bye bye. Much. Thank I'll you. Ciao. Bye bye. Thank bye bye. Bye. It was awesome. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. <laughs>